Just a few seconds before we begin. Shall I go? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming, uh, even though it's very late at the conference. And I would have gone home if I wasn't speaking here. <laughs> um, it seems to me that um, the theme of the conference was not really teaching to new heights, but it was stories. Everybody has been talking about storytelling. How many of you here have been talking about stories in this audience? There, you see? Um, and it was, um, I thought in the beginning, uh, I saw so many uh, talks about storytelling, digital storytelling, and I thought, what am I going to say that everybody else has not said? What am I going to be doing that everybody else has not done so far? But listening to some of you and listening to uh, Dr. Stephen Krashen in his talk yesterday, in his plenary talk, it, it dawned on me that we are talking about one of the most useful and, ve and important vehicles of language acquisition. And this is why I wanted to talk about this subject uh, at this conference. My talk is about digital storytelling. I'm going to be looking at digital tools. So hopefully you will learn a couple of tools that not everybody else has shown you today. Um, and um, I've used some of them. Some of them my trainees have used. Um, a lot of them have been great lessons that I've learned from some of you. So it's going to be a sharing session, and I hope you will find something useful. Picture this, um, a teacher holding a book up and telling a story to a group of young learners. Uh, it's a familiar picture, isn't it? It calls back images of bedtime stories. We learned language through bedtime stories when we were children. Storytelling is an important part of our mother tongue acquisition. My own grandmother told me hundreds of stories, most of them involved saints and, and great torture and, and horrible ways that these saints died. But <laughs> she was religious, what can I say? So it might say about my distorted sense of humor today, but those were the stories she told me. And my other grandmother told me other stories about her life in Izmir and where she was born in Russia. And my mother told me stories of her childhood and my aunt told me stories of her childhood on Crete, on the island of Crete, where they lived for some time. My father told me stories of hiding things before 1922 when the family uh, had to leave Izmir uh, and, and come to Greece. So all these are part of my language makeup of how I learned language. And now, um, okay, this was a little joke with myself. I don't have a very good sense of humor, apparently. Uh, but I was thinking of how I could begin my TESOL presentation and I made a little comic as I was practicing making comics with all the tools. This one was make, made with um, make-believe uh, comics. So it's, uh, it's, this is supposed to be me. But I wanted to go on from my first image and say, now picture this, a teacher holding up an iPad and showing a story to a group of learners. It's not very different from the first image. It was a book, it's an iPad, it could be a laptop. It's the slides that I'm showing you. And tonight, I'm telling you stories about my teaching. So stories is a great theme to develop. I think I'm going to go through this very quickly. Because I don't think, I think I'm preaching to the converted stories enhance language acquisition. They help with regard to the young learners, they help children acquire language. 
They help young children acquire values, yes, because we're not just teaching language dried, aseptic and clinical, deprived of all values and ideas and concepts. They transmit knowledge of the world to the children. Cultural, they give them a sense of cultural identity, cultural awareness. And they help children develop their cognitive abilities. They help them with their oracy, their speaking, and their literacy. Uh, a child can be pointing to the words on the page of a book even before they can read. They may uh, imitate the act of reading before they can even read because that's what adults do. They improve their numeracy. Parents very often read children's stories and they said, and how many little pigs were there? There were one, two, three, four. Their ability to concentrate, to keep an idea together for some span of time, their auditory ability, they turn them into good listeners who will then later on in life become better learners, not just English, in English, but overall. Um, they cater for this um, um, quality that's been doubted, the multiple intelligences, but take care of input in a variety of ways, visually, auditorily, and very often tactilely, because the, the taste and the the touch of a book. Even babies are given uh, books that are made of uh, fabric. Have you seen them? They're lovely, yes. Um, they develop their critical thinking and their creative thinking abilities, I think. I think if we look at uh, this famous triangle of Bloom's taxonomy, which is an, an amended triangle at the top. You can see creating. That used to be synthesis, but it's been recently changed into creating. And at the bottom, you can see understanding. For me, reading, storytelling takes care of both ends of the scale. On the comprehension level, the understanding, listening, reading later, and at the top of the scale, creating stories, telling stories. Listening to stories in the foreign language classroom can very naturally lead to storytelling, to speaking activities, and obviously reading can very naturally lead to story writing. So, for those of you who are thinking, or thinking of homework as well, because you live in a world where you have course books, you have curriculums, you have parents, and so on, I think stories can create the kinds of homework that are much more motivating, they're more purposeful for children, they're more meaningful, the more challenging but also doable, um, they're stimulating and creative. I think I'm going to show you this one because that one was a pretty picture. But it wasn't easy to read. I think there's something that students can take pride in and something which showcases their acquisition process. You can see how far they're progressing through what they have produced, the quality of the writing, the quality of the telling. I'm going to show you a couple of ideas of uh, digital activities for those of you who are interested in the digital aspect, although I must uh, confess that a lot of what I'm saying digitally can also be done non-digitally. Uh, if you don't have facilities that would allow you to use a laptop in the class and projector. Although most of these things can be done with just a single laptop and not even a projector. 
they can be done also. A lot of these ideas can be pulled together with paper, images, pictures, drawings, and words on paper. So I'm going to show you a couple of ideas um, from some tools that I like. And the first one is a very simple tool. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Animoto? Okay. Animoto, thank you very much. Animoto is a very simple tool. And I'm going to show you. Uh, it's a very simple tool for making stories uh, with pictures that you have, that you can upload to the tool. Okay? And um, if you are, uh, it's a free tool. You can have, um, as, a free, as an educator, you can also ask for a special education license, which allows you to uh, create animotos of longer than uh, 50 or 60 seconds, which is the normal thing. And uh, they can be used for storytelling, but also for all sorts of other things. Um, here I have um, a various stories um, that I've created myself. I'm just going to show you uh, a little animoto that I made for for a year, what happened in 2012. And it's just, it's just a, a collection of pictures and text. So it's a very, I'm just going to show you one minute. simple tool um, an equally simple tool could be a PowerPoint that you make yeah you can use PowerPoint with your students most teachers can use PowerPoint if you don't want to do this online it's also great to use pictures that children bring or they scan or that you can take a picture of and put in a little PowerPoint where they also write captions the right stories uh, I need to find my presentation again, sorry. Okay, there we are. So Animoto is the first simple tool, which is great for very young learners because you can very easily upload pictures and drawings, and they can write simple words and simple phrases. My family on the beach. This is great, you know. Storytelling for the very young class doesn't have to be very complicated. Don't get carried away with the word narrative and think that they have to be connectors and however and nevertheless every other phrase. And firstly, secondly, and lastly. Just a few phrases. It's a story. Um, another tool that I really like, and perhaps some of you have, I think I, I saw uh, this tool being mentioned in a couple of digital presentations, is Storybird. Storybird is an absolutely lovely um, digital tool, and I adore it. It's, uh, it's free, and it's... Um, I want to show you an example here. Let me just close down some of the windows I'm not using, because I will get confused eventually. There you are. Um, no, here we are. Uh, this is a, a tool uh, where uh, you have different art themes that people have put up, lots of pictures that various artists have put up, and you can take your students up to that tool, and with them, you can create a story. This one is a story that was done about my family and their pets, and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides this is free, it's on the web, and it looks like this. And this is the cover. Oops. Sorry. Not, this is not very good for... Okay, this is the cover. 
And this is a story about my friends and their pets. And this is a story that says, Richelieu is George and George's and George's new kitten. These are actual friends. He's very naughty but very cute. They found him outside a bar called Black Cat. Richelieu is almost black too. George and George live in the same block of flats as me, and so on. So this is a story about cats and dogs and the pets of my friends. All the art was found online. I didn't have to draw anything. If you go to this one, um, if you go to uh, Storybird itself, here is a palette of a story that we could make collaboratively. Okay? And I've chosen the cover image, but equally well, if I was working with a class, I could ask them to choose which picture they want for a cover, what's the title of their story, what do they want. I could ask them to work in groups. I'm not going to ask you to do this because it's not a workshop and I don't have very much time to do workshop tasks with you. I apologize. I could ask them in groups for each picture to write a few words. The groups could compare. We could choose the best words, the best lines. We could put the best lines up on the first slide, the second slide, and we could make a story. It's possible to make a story by adding images. So this one, I have already the cover, and I have the second picture, yeah? And um, then I, w I, can, I could add more episodes to this story. Would you like this one or this one that looks like the Loch Ness? The Loch Ness, okay. We could do that. So we have that now, and, and the picture can generate ideas in the class, and they could write a few lines. This is the beginning of the story. Now, a class can imagine how the story can go. They could say, it's about an explorer who was looking for the Loch Ness Monster, or it was about something else. Um, and then I could go to the next. I could add another image where I could say, do you want this one, or do you prefer this one? Or shall I put that one? Oh, I like that one with the monsters. And they might like this one and put some words in it. So eventually, we make a little book. The book can be downloaded. The book can be printed. The book can be put in their hands. They can take it home. So this is a great image. And one of the ways that um, I like to use this tool is um, what I call a picture karaoke. And you can do that with other kinds of images as well. I choose some images and make my slides. I have them ready. Or I choose some images and then I, I show an image for 20 seconds or 30 seconds and say, write something about it. And then I'll show the next one and then the next one. And for 30 seconds each time, the class can be writing something. And then at the end, we'll replay the images and, and the students can collaborate and choose the best phrases to make a collaborative story. So these activities generate collaborative storytelling and they can be great fun because they can be quite crazy and paradoxical. And kids love the crazy and the paradoxical. They don't want really nice, neat little characters who kiss their mother goodbye every morning. They want people who look for monsters, who are very smelly and so on and so forth and uh, who make loud noises, and who laugh loudly, and so on and so forth. I don't know if you agree with me. Do you agree? Okay, I don't. Children's humor is very different to ours. It's not subtle. If, if you're going to be funny for a child, you've got to be so outrageously obvious. And, you know, if you, someone is mean, they've got to be really horrible. You, you can't be just wishy-washy mean. Okay, so lots of ideas uh, are out there for young learners. I'm going to show you a couple more tools in a minute. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about adults as well. 
because uh, storytelling is not just good for children, it's good for adults. And I think we all feel compelled to tell stories. And I'm using the word that Dr. Krashen uses for his compelling reading. I feel that we are compelled, most of our human communication on a daily basis, we tell each other stories. Um, you know, I came in the morning, I tell you how my bus got la was late or how I lost something. These are all stories of our lives that we tell each other. Our news are stories that we tell each other. Stuff that happens to us, funny, strange, serious. We share stories all the time. So we need to teach our learners to tell stories and storytelling is a great way of not just acquiring but also using language. Um, stories are great, not because they're great for language production, but they engage the learners in all sorts of different ways. They, gain, they engage them emotionally, personally. They mobilize very large areas of language. They're not kind of grammar specific. They uh, combine all the scales and they are more memorable than course book characters who no one remembers. How many people do you remember from your course books? And you teach them. Do you remember any sentences that you can shout out to me from your course book exercises that you used yesterday? No. If you do, you're a very strange person. <laughs> And the question that very often people tell me, oh, yeah, well, okay, but why digital? I think that's a decision you have to make on your own. I'm just offering the tools. As I said, a lot of this stuff can be done with simple pen and paper, with drawings, with pictures, with students on the floor, drawing with crayons. I don't care how you do it. The storytelling is in the heart of it. I'm just showing you a few more tools. I think maybe with adults I could say, Okay, I think adults are more difficult to engage because we're no longer in this time. We, don't lo we no longer sit around the fire. We no longer relax. Families don't get together. We don't get together with our friends. Um, so we tell stories in other ways. We tell a lot of stories digitally. I tell stories on Facebook. I read your stories on Facebook, your updates, what you're engaged with what you're interested in at the moment. And also, um, with adults, stories can be rehearsed. They can be more satisfactory for the learners' communicative needs. I, I apologize for this very heavy text here. It looks horrible. Sorry. Um, they are a more concrete evidence of progress than, you know, tests and counter-tests. Um, I think digital homework is more likely to be done by adults. They're more interested. They don't care so much about going right off writing little compositions. You know, how, how often do you write compositions? Um, they're, they're more likely to be motivated to be doing other things. Like um, Also, they, they form the basis for great presentation skills, which we all need to do. Uh, in one way or another in our life, in our professional life. Um, and maybe also for me, they do offer the basis of good report writing. I think also, um, the final point is that in terms of the interpersonal skills, they can help adults maintain good social relationships and interpersonal relationships. When you're learning a foreign language, People teach you how to do this, how to do that, and the social chit chat and the and the you know the small talk uh, of making contact, human contact uh, outside the job with people is stories. It's you know your life, telling people about your life. Okay, um, maybe some other tools might be more in order for adults rather than. Um, you know, story bird, and the news is a good source, and uh, video. 
I have um, here a, an example of a lesson which we're going to go through very quickly. And that could be, that could generate a story writing activity and then later on a reading. Um, Dr. Krashen, who happens to be in this room, that's why I'm giving, you know, mentioning your name so frequently. No, because you did say some things that are very relevant, and I'm using some of your terminology. Um, that's until I create my own. Um, I think uh, what he's talking about is compelling reading of or on of our own. I'm compelled to read something that I fancy. Personally, I think this is fine, but I think we can also create compelling reasons for our learners to want to read things that they didn't plan or were compelled to read anyway. I believe the teacher has ways of getting the learners motivated to read things that they might otherwise not choose to read, but we can make them compelled to read. We can make them curious. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, teachers are there. They're not just there to watch the learners read compelling stuff and have chats about them. So here's one activity that might get the learners to read something. And it's, uh, first of all, you show them maybe a headline. TV reporter speaks about speech problem at Grammys. And what do you think that's going to be? Can you talk to someone next to you for half a second and say, what do you think this is going to be about? Then you're going to watch a little video just to see what it was about. Do you want to talk to someone? Say, hi, I'm Angelos. I think this is going to be about. <laughs> Enough. I say, Ftani. Let's see what this is about. And backstage coverage we're seeing for the very first time. So read. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy vertation tonight. We had a very Darrison fight. Let's go ahead, Terrace Chase English for the bit. They had the pet. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Okay, would you like to see that again? Right, just to understand. PM. Oh, sorry, I don't want this one. And backstage coverage we're seeing for the very first time, so read. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy vertation tonight. We had a very Darrison fight. Let's go ahead, Terrace Chase English for the bit. They had the pet. <laughs> okay. What did she say? She had a stroke. Actually, you're not very far. Did, was she saying something of significance? Was it comprehensible? Did you understand what she was saying? Was she using English? No. OK, as the basis for a lesson, this generated okay, all this kind of talk with the learners. And eventually, uh, they produced this. Uh, they produced this that said, we made a little uh, newspaper on 40.com, which I'm going to show you straight away. And it said, reporter speaks unknown language. I haven't got the whole image, but that's what they... A reporter in a mystery way started speaking an unknown foreign language on television. She was reporting the news about the grammar. I can't remember what they said. Speaking this language, the linguists are still trying to discover this language. Some people say it's from another planet. This was something that a class, after group work and correlating and collaborating, they got together. They took that, they did that little paper on Fodi.com, which looks uh, hum humongous here. And that's because <coughs> of this. Fodi.com is a place where you can input the title, you can input the text, 
and it will make it look like a newspaper and then you can print it or embed it on your blog or your website and it looks like it's newspaper news. Okay. <clears throat> Later, this class was given, was told, okay, now do you want to really know what happened to this reporter? And they read the news, this news report, which said that probably the woman had a minor stroke on the air and she, um, and they also then watched the next video on YouTube in which she herself speaks about the incident that happened to her on air. This was very interesting to the class. This is what she's saying. I was sitting on live trial. I, was starting, I started to think the words on the page are blurry. She couldn't see, blah, blah, blah. So that was what they read and the comprehension task for the day. I think um, a lot of what we do in the classroom needs to be translated into words. Storytelling is great with pictures, but students need to talk, students need to write, students need to express themselves. And words that uh, is not just what is set on paper. I think for me, it's a very significant quote in the sense that language needs to express something meaningful to the learners or to mean something to them. And course book exercises don't tend to do that very much. So um, homework that's like of this kind might be more interesting to them. This is a page uh, that leads us to uh, a, a website, hang on a minute, sorry. No, that's not the guy I wanted to see right now. Um, yeah, I'm looking for Voxopop. I'm sure it's here, but everything got scrunched up uh, when, when you know. Ah, there we are, okay. Um, this is a great example of a teacher who set a piece of homework to the class and they go to this website where you can create a speaking group and you speak the task into the microphone and the class logs on um, and they speak, they record their homework. So this is the teacher and he says, I would like you to click the following link and listen to Adam Wade tell a story. Your response to the following questions will be used during class conversations about Unit 8 about storytelling. Questions. So what he's giving them work? some questions, okay? I'm not going to... Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. This, this is one learner. My opinion about the video of Adam Wait. I will argue that the story is a, re is a reality for many good guys who have dreams in life, but often must keep the nap early. This is another learner. Hello. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, classmates. In this occasion, uh, I will say my... Okay. I don't, I don't want to s spend uh, hi, time Jim. listening hi, to different learners, but you understand how it works. The great thing about sites like this is you can also rehearse. These, this is a very low level class and obviously that's the level of progress and they don't sound very fluent, but they can go back and record and re-record. They can rehearse their story and finally record the version they're happy with. Um, other websites like this um, a great website that you may have seen. How many of you are familiar with VoiceThread? I know Sue is and a couple of you are oh, great. Okay. VoiceThread is another wonderful uh, <coughs> web website for this kind of digital storytelling homework. Uh, and this is a, a, a word cloud uh, that was used in class to predict the contents of a story. And there is a, a Rolls-Royce image and something that some, some elements of a bank. 
In other words, collateral, roles, laugh, fortune, worth, worked, and so on and so forth. This was an adult class. And so the class did quite a lot of predicting in class. What were the, was the story going to be about? What was the text going to be about? <coughs> and then <coughs> on VoiceThread, I left them an instruction that they had to record their own version of the story, and they could record it either spoken or in writing. This Eileen recorded her own version. Hi, Marissa. No, this one is in writing. Miriam recorded her own version in writing. Okay? Um, it doesn't matter why. I can't remember why. I think maybe her audio wasn't very good. But she had the choice to do it in writing. And uh, another learner, actually this was for a group a of man? teachers. Eileen is a non-native. Hi, Marissa. Here's my attempt. I hope the real thing's much more interesting than mine. A man walked into a London bank to request a loan to buy a new Rolls Royce. He told the loans officer that although he had not worked for some time, he was good for the money and was going to be worth a fortune someday soon. The banker was puzzled by the man's request and didn't see how his plan to borrow the money would help earn his fortune. The man explained that the car would bring a little joy into his life. And he had heard that people okay. who enjoy think, life and laugh often are successful. I think uh, the Sylvia Guinan, who is also a speaker here at the conference, did uh, something there herself. Is Sylvia around? No. Okay. Uh, so... At the end of this, um, I recorded the actual story that I was going to give them. And I also emailed it to them. And the story went like this. This woman borrowed 5,000 pounds to go to America. Uh, <clears throat> and they said, what's the collateral? And she said, I have a Rolls Royce. I said, OK, we'll take that. And they took the car and they parked it in the bank garage. She took the 5,000 loan, went off to the state, and she came back. And I said to her, well, we checked out your background, and you have a lot of money. Why did you borrow the, uh, the, the 5,000 pounds? She said, where else could I have parked my car <laughs> for, 15, for 15 pounds, which was the interest that I pay for the 5,000 loan. So this is a good story. And it was done with a group of people working, uh, doing an ESP course, a business English course. So they appreciated it. And then they discussed, would that have been possible in a Greek back? Never. First of all, they don't have parking lots. <laughs> okay, here's my presentation back there. Okay, so we looked at VoiceThread. I think also maybe <clears throat> it might be a good idea not to forget humor and creativity, and, and also the fact that storytelling is not only about heavy loads of narrative that's well connected and very articulate and very uh, vocabulary sophisticated or rich. It can be very simple lines. It can be also, it can be uh, a little joke, a little anecdote. It can be a little dialogue, because sometimes when we tell stories, we also use dialogue, don't we? And um, I wanted to show you, this is a great, this and similar sites are very good for adults. Uh, this one is called Bombay TV. And uh, <clears throat> one needs to be quite careful with it, of course, because it shows a lot of Indian films, a lot of Bollywood video, uh, clips. And what uh, the learners can do is they can write new subtitles in English. Or uh, if, you, if you notice up here, I don't know if it's visible, but this is a microphone. They can record their own voices above the voices of the actors. And they can either record narrative or they can record dialogue. And I want to show you uh, one or two that my trainees 
made. I think, yeah, I think this was um, a CELTA group that was really funny. And it was after teaching practice. And um, they were a little bit fed up with our comments. And we had shown them this. And this is what they produced. <laughs> now, this was a story, and it was a really funny one, and it showed how they felt about teaching practice feedback. It was a good message. What do you expect me to do? Learn it all in two weeks? And it was, it was actually a great, great, uh, it was very funny. Uh, another one that we made for a friend uh, who was about to get an Elton's Award. This was uh, this one. Can I minister, sir? My senior officers, dosto. I think this was for Graham Stanley. This काम के लिए मुझे ये medal दिया जा रहा है. वो काम बेशक इन हाथों से हुआ है. लेकिन इन हाथों में शक्ति मेरी माँ की थी. Um, I think um, there are various things we can do with digital stories. We can present language. They can be tools for presenting and highlighting language, if that's what you want to do. They can be interpreted and dramatized in class, and you can do drama activities with them. You can dramatize a reading, for example, and turn it into a play, and that's a great storytelling activity. The students can create their own stories, and that involves speaking and writing. They can be the lead-in activity to um, uh, reading or listening lessons. They're kind of natural part of task-based learning because you can use storytelling, and then the students can actually read the story themselves and be compelled to read it. They generate creative thinking and critical thinking, I think. And they are part of what we call, it's holistic learning. It's not a little chunky, itty-bitty bites of grammar McNuggets. It's language seen as a whole. It's language to express meaning. It's language to express emotion and to communicate. And I think for adults, some of the same things hold true, that hold true for young learners. They promote language acquisition, cultural awareness, social awareness, motivation, and oral and written fluency. <clears throat> and they can help them be more confident, learn to socialize more eff effectively, to, um, to be able to use sustained talk. You know, talking for a length of time is, is not easy when when your course books um, encourage only question and answer sequences or yes, no, you know, little fragments of conversation, sustained talk needs practice. They uh, help concentrate, the learners to concentrate, uh, enhance auditory ability, uh, critical and creative thinking, and if you like, they combine a number of media to generate different stimuluses for the learners. I think we feel compelled to tell stories, and stories are the placeholders of language. And if we don't have stories, language tends to slip away and be forgotten. Thank you very much.